Hey there, I'm Steve, and welcome to Jamson Entertainment. Today in the podcast, I have Kurt Avard. Met him on Discord. He's a writer, and his first book, First Do No Harm, is coming out, coincidentally, on my birthday, the September 25th. Hey, Kurt, how's it going? Hey, Steve, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. All right, so where did your love for writing stories and uh, history come from? Because this is a historical fiction, correct? Yes, yes. And ironically, uh, writing was never something I had intended to do. Um, I was that kid back in school who hated writing essays because they always made you work in that little bit of a box. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, and you know... It was, maybe maybe you it was know, the limitations. <laughs> you know, and, and you know what? Maybe that's what it was. Um, I did always grow up loving history. I'm, my father was a history teacher for 25 years and, and all that time kept feeding books in front of me, history texts, all this kind of stuff like that. So I guess on that level... I, I I was in love with history before I was in love with writing. Hmm. Um, ended up kind of stumbling into the whole writing thing as I was trying to look for a job, actually, after uh, I was in college. So, uh, a bit of a rough patch from the whole employment side. I wanted to make sure I was staying staying productive, staying creative, and I wrote the first book I have, a sci-fi thing, which has never seen the light of day, uh, but I wrote it as a bar bet against myself. You think I mean, it might? It, it might. <laughs> it might, but not without some extensive editing. So... Uh, <laughs> By pure dumb luck, let's just put it that way. Uh, oh, um, well, I guess it kind of answers my next question. Did you always want to write historical fiction, but you just mentioned sci-fi, or... Oh, no, let's go with that. Did you always want to write historical fiction? You know, it, it was one of those things that... No, I guess, let me, let me actually answer the question. I'm sorry, I'm going to dance around an awful lot. It's one of the things when you ask a writer a question... They'll go until you get them to stop. So, um, honestly, for me, I, I started writing short stories. I wrote that sci-fi piece, and uh, no historical fiction ended up becoming a bit of a happy accident. Um, this story, the one that's in first, you know, harm, is actually based on true events, um, and it was a story that I discovered when actually I was living over in Austria about six, seven years ago. Oh wow! Yeah, it was it was an absolutely incredible time of my life. Um, but I remember walking into the cathedral in the center of town and hearing the kind of barest whispers about this t this tale after I went through the catacombs underneath the actual cathedral itself. Um, and let me tell you, honestly, after hearing the story, I started following that. I started pulling threads here and there. And though it's been six or seven years ago, that, that story kind of stayed in the back of my mind the entire time. You know, kind of like that, that chorus, you know, you hear like a, a song, it's, it's kind of like stuck in there. It was very much like that kind of thought. Um... And I started to kind of realize when I started writing this particular project that history is one of those areas that, one, we never really kind of learn the right way. It's always like boring facts and, and names and people you're never going to meet, so why do I care? Story that just had to be shared. It was, I mean, it had everything. It had this, you know, horror, it had bravery, it had courage, it had faith, it had madness. All of these things were tied up. So historical fiction just became the perfect genre to kind of express... Well, to express that entire uh, that entire narrative, to to give that that same love that I have of history to hopefully to other people as well. Hmm. And and uh, you kind of, I mean, you're you're hinting at it, but what's what is the synopsis of your of your story? It's um, I, I've read the first five chapters. I really liked it. I honestly did. Okay. I'm really Thank looking you. forward. I mean, I'm still reading Children of Dune, but it's the next okay. book. I'm gonna read First Do No Harm right after Children of Dune. It's a medical so if, mystery. Yes. So uh, if I can just kind of pick up the thread right there. So medical mystery, sure. But which is, I know kind of comes off of this kind of being this really kind of bizarre idea. But um, we meet our protagonist, Dietrich. Now, Dietrich, of course, is this minor nobleman. Seems a little bit weird, but he's, he's part of the, of the actual Night Watch. It was a very common organization at the time. And while out on patrol one evening, he, come across, he comes across a body that's been ravaged by kind of like disease, but at the same time, there's also some kind of foul play. There's hints of foul play that are going on here. So Dietrich is always a good guy for a mystery. He's trying to go and run down both killer and cure at the same time, as both the disease and this killer kind of continues to kind of permeate throughout the city, each taking and you know, creating their own deadly toll hmm. uh, from borough to borough, street to street. Now, I, I don't want to give it too much away, but I will say, along the way, we definitely ask ourselves some questions, both about, you know, if you want to call it 
justice, this, that. I mean, there's, there's a, there's something really. I will say that right there. I'm a little nervous about giving away too much, you know. Uh, Steve, no, I no, I can, I completely easy. understand. Um, from just the first five chapters, I've only really seen the medical mystery. I, you're saying that there's, that there's uh, people like it that are, that are involved. True. Yes, I mean it, it's it's something that is only kind of hinted at early on, and I and it's one of those. If I can just add a sidestep for half a second, I find an awful lot of time. There's a lot of stories I can kind of put before us as readers. It's very ironclad. It says, okay, here's the bad guy in the first thirty seconds. He's wearing a black hat. He's kicked a puppy. We know he's evil. Oh yeah, this is and more ambiguous. Yeah, and I think that, that ambiguity, I think to a certain degree, almost kind of helps sell the time period itself. Like I'm sure you saw, we're in Austria, it's the you know the end of the 17th century. It's like, we're not quite in that modern era just yet, Right. but we're not quite in the Middle Ages either. We're kind of like trying to creep from superstition. Yeah, like that. yeah, I, I really yeah. like that. Cause the, the, especially with the uh, the Bishop uh, Wildrich. Yes, <laughs> yes. He, he, he is that, 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 that bridge... Well, no, Dietrich is actually the bridge, but I mean, you can see through Wildrich the superstition, but he's kind of like, uh, maybe do some science, maybe it's not just devils. Well, and that was the fun thing about this, too, is that this is a time period that I don't think I've ever read another book that focuses on this time period. The closest I can probably get is, um, there's a series of Spanish novels called, I think, Alatriste. There was a, a movie with Viggo Mortensen about 10, 15 years ago. Um, but they were talking about the Spanish Golden Age in like the 1600s, 1700s. Hmm. But other than that, I don't think I've ever come across any other text that talks about this time period. And it's just, it's so fascinating. We have their version of a world war with the Thirty Years' War. We have the church, which for hundreds of years has just been dominating society. And now it's kind of like, no, 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 the church goes off to the side. We let politics kind of take a front seat here. Right. So, so much is in flux. We have just a lot of interesting questions happening and I think you're right to point out Vildorich is definitely an example of that, that older school that kind of like this old guy who's just trying to get through the, you know, the golden years of his life before he goes up to you know wherever he goes after death here but it became a really kind of fun canvas to kind of set up different characters different personalities and to almost see what they would do like I'm, at this point you've met Max right and I think you've also right. met Dietrich's sister Sophie haven't you mm -hmm. and, the, uh, um, and, and Abraham Yes, Abraham, exactly. Abraham, he's a real character. So, I just so, been so, introduced to him, and he's he's awesome. But so tell, tell tell your listeners a little bit more about Abraham, because I definitely could go and say a lot, but I, I want to hear it from someone who's come under with fresh eyes. So tell what do you, what would you think of Abraham? Well, okay, so he's he's guarded. And he he has every reason to be guarded because he's Jewish in a time. Well, in the in the book, it even says that the Jews were basically evicted from the city. Uh, is that... Unfortunately, yes. Yes, um, that's that's. I think you picked a great time period because it's about the Black Pig, which I'm sure there's a lot of writing there and a lot of research that could make mm -hmm. give you a lot of ideas to write about. But it's also mm -hmm. like a very like this happening now. Oh my God! Can you imagine what it would be like if this, if, if the segregation and the the hatred for one another were as bad then as I don't know where I'm going with that, but there's a, it. It it's lends itself right. to great drama and great tension, and, well, and and also good comedy because the way Abraham just knows how to he knows how to behave. In front of certain people, he knows his audience, which is a comedian thing. You got to know your audience, and the way he can he can con conduct himself, and the way he just his wit, he can just fire back, like being complimentary but insulting at the same time. It's really really good. So I don't know if I, I, I articulated that correctly. No, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, Abraham has never really been intended to me to be like the comic relief in the book. I mean, th there's certainly definitely comedy that travels from character to character. But um, Abraham was a really fun kind of personality to play with. I'm actually he's inspired by a very good friend of mine, who has that kind of very British wit, so that very dry, very acerbic kind of uh, sense of humor. 
where he's giving you a very irreverent comment, this observation, but he's, he's on the ball, and you know when it comes right down to it, he will be in your corner. Right. Um, but I think you're right, too. I think like there's just a time period, and this is a series of events that, can you imagine, there, there's so much stuff going on in the U.S., around the world, with the pandemic, with, with politics. That I think people's heads time. would explode today if they saw the characters that are in this book cooperating. Their heads would explode. True. It's like, they're cooperating? True. Well, and, and, and I think you're going to see some actually some conflict a little bit later on as well as we kind of try to see, well, will we have Catholics and Jews work together? Well, what about Muslims? Because at this point, there still are a lot of Muslims in the city itself. Hmm. Um, one thing I kind of discovered, actually, as I was researching this book and learning more behind it, especially the history of the time period, is that Vienna was this perfect cauldron. It was like a New York of its time. Mm. It, w- it stood right between East and West. We have all of Western European kind of political thought on one side, and on the other side, we still have all the Ottoman Turks who, like, 20 years before, have just tried to invade the city, and actually a few years after this, will try doing it again. So, it's it, it's balanced almost precariously between East and West, and it was just it was. I was amazed as I was writing this how everything seemed to fall into place. I I almost had to invent. I invented very little behind this. Let me just put it that way. I know a lot of people look at a piece of fiction and say, oh, no, this this didn't happen, or this didn't happen. Um, but outside of a few characters, a lot of this did. A lot of the characters you meet, a lot of the ideas that are expressed, a lot of these things were encapsulated at that time period. And it was just, it was eye-opening, to say the least, um, but shocking <laughs> at the more on a more basic level, just to see how dramatic this, this, you know, these few years were within each other. So, hmm. forgive me, again, like I said, if you, give, if you give me a platform to stand on, I'm going to go, I'll go off at the, the deep end on that. No, no, so. no, no, no. I mean, this is really your podcast. I'm just the host. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, no. I'm just, again, I'm lucky just to even have been on here. So, uh. um, so it's written in first person, Dietrich's perspective. Mm-hmm. I really liked it. It, uh, I'm, it's easy for me to get into the world of a book, but it's even more immersive just from one perspective. Is it all from Dietrich's perspective? I, I yes. mean, I was writing down questions, and I didn't write down like the one I just asked um, because I wasn't sure until I read all five chapters. Like, I think this is going to be all from Dietrich's perspective because I, I wasn't yes. sure if it was going to shift to to like maybe at Abraham at some point or Wilderich at another point. So. I think we've gotten really used to that idea in writing. I mean, a lot of the big names books, uh, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, what have you, it's always just kind of omniscient third person. Uh, Game of Thrones is a little different because, yes, each chapter is a character, yeah. but it's still someone else telling the story. And, and you know what? And that's that's completely fair to make the comment. But we're, but we're looking over somebody's shoulder consistently, though. Right, right. right. And while we, we are given kind of we're privy to some of the thoughts that they have in their head, what we don't tend to see is we're still kept at a distance you know um even the two of us talking here you know you're you're responding to what i'm telling you but there's always that kind of question like okay so what about this or what about that and dietrich was an interesting enough character to kind of use just because he is a little bit abnormal by what we kind of think of at the time period so i didn't want to go and shortchange him i didn't want to shortchange any kind of impressions he had or thought processes and yeah, no, the entire thing is purely from his perspective. I mean, he's there to... He's there to kind of, you know, pull back the curtain on the entire thing. That's really awesome, because it, you are almost Dietrich. I mean, you, <laughs> me, be, you being the reader. You're, I mean, because it's from the first-person perspective. Your experience... Well, it, it just, at least for me, I have such a great imagination that... It just kind of puts me there. Like when you describe the stench of the body when he was examining it in the 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 uh, cottage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. But, but and, and you know what? And that's the thing is that um, I remember at one point my sister actually was a an, my editor for this, my first pass for conceptual ideas and things like that as well. Um, honestly, if I she knows how much I appreciate her, but uh, is there a parallel between you and Dietrich and your sister and Sophie? There, there's, there's, there's a little bit. I will say that uh, there's certain personality traits that definitely we both exhibit between the two of us, um, and definitely kind of playful relationship that that does kind of 
show itself further and further as you go into the book. But um, I remember one of her first remarks when she was reading some of these chapters was that it was almost a cinematic thing. So I'm actually, I'm, I feel quite happy to know that when you're reading through this that those sensory ideas were such an impact to you because oh, I feel like yes go ahead yes I mean just in the first like few sentences few paragraphs where he's where he's fishing for his tinder box playing with yes. his pipe I was like wow it's like well, I'm doing this <laughs> and, and that's the thing too like I'm not a smoker uh, never had never had cigarettes in my life like it's just one of those things that honestly for me though was you know we have a guy who's in the middle of it, you know, it's in the darkness right now, he's out, he's out by himself, what's he gonna do? He's gonna smoke, like, that's what he's gonna do, he's, he's, <laughs> what else is there to do when you walk around the city at night? Um, it, plus it's cold outside, he needs some kind of warmth, and that's, I mean, that's, yes, I, I mean, I do have a pipe, I, I tried to get into smoking pipe, because I just, I don't know, I'm a dork, I want to look so sophisticated, <laughs> but, yes, not some say. <laughs> But no, there is some kind of warmth there, and you, I mean, like, you're really good, very descriptive, uh, and not in, like, uh, Tolkien way, where it's like, I don't need to know the history of the pipe. <laughs> you're very descriptive where it just immerses you in this world from the get-go, and I wanted to get warm, too. <laughs> the I, pipe I, is a good flattered. way to do that. I'm flattered. I remember actually reading as a kid, um, so there was a movie, Master and Commander, uh, Russell Crowe, Paul Bettany, this goes back 15, 20 years. Um, if you haven't seen it, I definitely say go for it. Oh, Historical yeah. fiction, like 1800s, Napoleonic on the ship. But um, the book that those movies, that that movie is based on, that book series, spends like a page and a half describing the splinter on the mast of a ship. And like, I'm sorry. That's, that's why I hated the Sam uh, chapters in the book two of Game of Thrones. Mm hmm. Oh my god, yes, I know he's tired, I know he's cold, I know he's wet, shut up! <laughs> and that's the thing, it, it, it's kind of funny, like, and I feel bad because there's, it's... A lot of people have asked me, you know, how do you get the ideas that you write, or how do you know what to, what to say, and there's really no single way to approach it. I just know that for me, I try to write what I would like to read. Um... So for me, like, I, I'm, I'm happy to have that descriptive. I love kind of that, that thing. I don't, I don't want to just be an eye person. I want, to, I want to hear it. I want to smell it. I want to feel it. But a lot of writers kind of fall to one of the other extremes. Hmm. Um, George R. R. Martin is one of the ones that goes and just kind of says, ah, I'm having fun with adjectives in this paragraph. And it becomes a page and a half long for that one paragraph. And it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. But you have to read it three times to figure out what the heck he's saying. Hmm. No, I I have a problem with the description because I just thought of a gripe I had with the first book. Okay. I don't need to know all these little houses and what they're wearing and just these little details about their armors. Like, come on, Martin. I, I think to a certain extent, um, every now and again, Mar uh, Martin kind of gets play. It, it, I don't want to say gets playful with himself because that's the really the wrong connection. We might get an, you know, an NSFW on this podcast episode, but. Uh, um, What's the what's the idea? They write what they know. So right. like some writers, and, and he's that. another historical fiction because at least the first book is actually based off a real conflict in England between the Lancasters and um, I can't remember the other one. But the funny, of, the funny enough, versus, yeah. there's an actual historical fiction about that. I haven't read it, but my brother has read it. There's the actual historical fiction about that, and it's very similar to the first book of uh, in the Game of Thrones. I'm not sure See, if, if Martin was partially inspired by that fictional book or if it's just his research led him to the same conclusion for a similar storyline. It's kind of funny that you say that, that the War of Roses ended up giving him, um, I guess, the idea behind Game of Thrones. I, I have heard people say that when you look at Game of Thrones, you look at it as being a, a medieval piece set in a, in a fantastic world. Right. Um... And, and not for nothing, I think when the books first came out, I was anticipating fantasy being a little bit different, you know, kind of very much more kind of Harry Turtle fantasy or or um, Jeff. Anyway, oh my gosh, not Jeff. Jeff Shara? No. You're you're more well read than I am, so I'll well, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you. But or David Eddings, for example, if for another fantasy thing like the Elenium, or I can't even think of the other one at the moment, or Terry Brooks for the Shannara stuff, or Ari Salvatore even like we. We had this perception it was supposed to be more fantastic, have more magic in it. Yeah, and his is more like soft fantasy, where he's like, yeah, it exists, but it it's forgotten. It's a myth. It's a legend. So to the to 
most of the characters, it doesn't exist. It's just nonsense. Yes. But then there are some characters like, yeah, this totally exists. That's why you have yes. dragons towards the end of the first book. Um, it, 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 but that's that's the kind of playful thing I think that I was trying to almost kind of go for with first, you know, harm at the same time too. Is that like we like we already said before, we're in this spot where we don't really know really. We don't really believe in devils anymore, do we? Like, devils don't exist, but we, at the same time, we have clearly something that's unexplained. We don't have modern germ theory. We don't have this. We don't have that. Right. You know, we have old prejudices that kind of get in the way. Which is, which is one thing I really liked about Abraham, because he gave Dietrich the aha moments, like, and the worrisome was like, oh, wait, wait, this is transmittable? It's <laughs> exactly. not just something I found? <laughs> exactly. Like, I mean, crap. I, 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 I mean, like... And he's just, and he was just, and Abraham's a spitball, and it's transmittable through touch. We don't know if it's, I, I mean, I don't know if it's airborne or not yet, and it, it hasn't been explained. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I'll look forward I, to reading. Which I don't know. I read the first five chapters. Do I start the book again, or start at chapter six? <laughs> uh, if if I were you, I probably would start from the first one because I I will say I fell into the old kind of serial kind of approach to this, um, where each chapter in theory can almost kind of roll into the next one so we have a little bit of that cliffhanger going yes you had you had I'm a sure bit of that, that with the first three the mm -hmm. fourth one was a little not immediate and then the fifth one was even more like next moment instead of instead of like a uh, continual you know it was one of the things that i think i'm always kind of bitter about with some kind of books is um they never really give you a chance to breathe um and i tried really hard to try to give readers a, a moment every now and again that okay we're getting too heavy, we're getting too light. I mean, to, to find that almost kind of wave of tension and release, that wave of tension and release. Um, so I think you're right. I think the fourth chapter slows down a little bit from what we are seeing, that, you know, one, two, three going through it. Um, but it does. One second. Of course. <laughs> I almost of course. lost battery. But it does, pick, it does definitely pick back up in terms of tempo, I will say that. Um, I don't know. Like I said. A lot of this is just trying to write. I think what I would try to read myself, but uh... I, I, maybe I didn't describe it. Um, but the the first few chapters seems like it's with all in the same five six hours or so. But then, uh, like by the fourth or fifth chapter, it's like the next day. I, I mean, that's yes, that's yes. it's not probably not necessarily five or six hours, but that's just uh, to give an example. Mm -hmm. It's like first chapter is hour one, next chapter hour two, and so on, and then chapter four is like, next day. Well, I, I will say the the entire breadth of these events tried to mirror the original timeline, so we're looking at like, maybe a couple of months at the most. Um, I mean, this is a heavy thing that comes and just hammers the entire city. Uh, if you ever end up doing secondary research about it, it is, it is terrible, at the same time it's just incredibly moving. Hmm. Um, but you're right. I was just thinking about it right now. First few couple chapters are, I think, one night, the next morning, and then a couple, a little bit of time after that. Um, you could have, you could have, I mean, arguably, you could have just not gone with chapters, and sure. the, the first, like reading the first chapter, especially into the second chapter, just they could have been one chapter. That's how fluid it was. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I really do. I know that that for me, when I was writing it in the first place, um, actually, I did most of this writing in a Starbucks. Um, <laughs> My, my my day at that point was get up, do a bit of a workout, go right, and then I have my my day job in the evening. Um, so I would try to hash out as much as I could. And after about you know two three thousand words, it was like you know five six pages pretty easily. Um, and in my mind, I don't want to go. I don't want to bore you as a reader. I want to make sure I can kind of give you the idea, give you a nice kind of almost you know standalone tale for this chapter, and then move on. Um, which I think, it's kind of funny now that I think about it, the more that I write, the more I realize that the structure in which I think I approach a lot of stories um, is almost in response to the stuff that's really ticked me off of reading throughout my life. So, I mean, uh, I think, like, have you have you read Andy Weir, The Martian? Like, like I said, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a very casual reader. Um, I'm, that's, not, I'm, that's not a problem. I, Honestly, I'm reading Children of Dune because uh, there's another YouTube personality that has a book club, and this okay. is the third installment of her Dune book club. And never so, read Dune until this, and I really okay. like Dune. <laughs> but but Dune's a perfect example. Uh, without going to too much into spoilers, obviously, I mean the, the beginning of the entire book is them arriving and then them losing the planet. I mean that happens in the first you know 45 pages. 
Yeah. But each time we have a chapter break, we have here's a particular scene that will advance the plot. Here's another one at the same time. Here's another one at the, at the same time. There's not a lot of empty space in the book, and I'm sure you can, you know. They no, I, I get you. It jumps. I mean, it doesn't always jump from character to character. I mean, there might be mm -hmm. two Paul um, chapters, maybe three Paul chapters back to back. But I know what you're talking about. Yeah, um, so it's just the idea of being able to um, <laughs> I, I, what's what's the old phrase? I think I heard it from my grandfather way back when. You know, It's, it's the literary equivalent of piss or get off the pot. So, you know, say your piece, get it done, move on. You know, be short, be brief, be seated. Moving, hitting the idea going forward. So, that was the goal, at least. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, well, you talked about it a little bit, but how, how did you specifically prepare and research for, for this one? I mean, I know you, you first heard about it when you were in Austria, hmm. but from there, where did, where did it go? Uh, well, the first thing I did is I found out about this when I was on the catacombs tour underneath Stefan's Dome. Uh, actually, the cathedral that we... Oh, it's an actual see. place. Yes, it is. Oh, uh, wow. There, for the most part, if I name something by name, um, I could point this in the actual city itself. Hmm. Um, I, I fought long and hard about actually putting a map in with the book so you could have an idea. Um, but the cathedral that I mentioned here, Stefan's Dome, is both the... Well, at one point, was the geographical heart and was the spiritual heart as well for the city. Um, yeah. Absolutely gorgeous cathedral. And I remember actually when I was day one that I was in Vienna itself, I stumbled into the cathedral and discovered they had a catacombs tour. And I had first heard about the story actually during that catacombs tour. I will not surprise you to probably say that um, underground, there's an entire floor where it's just a pile of bones actually from this plague. Uh, wow. Is, yes, is this the Black Plague, or is this another plague? This is the Great Plague of 1679. So this is the Black Plague. Oh. This is the one that goes down in all the history books. This is the I kill one in three across Europe kind of plague. Yeah, it took out, like... At the time... It, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, no, at the time, a third of the world's population, didn't it? Or at least, the, yes. or at least Europe... Well, the, the, the funny thing is that it, it was about a third, but it would come about every 20 or 25 years or so. So there was some cyclical nature to it as a new strain if it would come through. So if you oh, the so it wasn't period, like Spanish flu yeah. where it did its damage. They thought things were good, and then it did even more damage. Uh, Yeah, that, that's about the long and short of it. That's that's one of, the, I think, the common misnomers that we assume the Black Death comes in like a thunderbolt, hammers the entire world, and then it's like... Deuce and just kind of bounces. Oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't know it was. It was over uh, years. I did, I thought it was maybe a few years, but it sounds like it's been over. Like maybe. Well, oh, how, how long did it last? I, I honestly I couldn't give you the exact terminology. What I will say is, imagine you mentioned about how would it be today if we had the pandemic for the coronavirus and how that kind of affects society as a whole. With modern air travel, how quickly did the entire world get infected? What two, three months? Yeah. I thought it was less than that. But, I, but there we go, even less than that. Yeah, it was like a month. Well, consider, considering the kind of space in which that people kind of lived back in that time period, it was much more difficult for disease to spread from you know province to province, state to state. But yeah, um, people were more localized then. They there exactly. were there were whole, weren't a whole lot of travelers. I mean, maybe cities, but not not necessarily countries and world. But that that but that lower transmission rate ended up becoming just long enough for the population of one area to kind of get through and recover from the first hit, mm. that it would come back in again. So we're having these kind of ripple effects where if I hit over here in Austria and it ripples out towards France, by the time it gets to France, it might not be that bad. But another ripple hits Spain, and Spain travels up to France too. So we have these these conflicting ripples that hit wow. different areas around consistently. <laughs> I, I, think the, I think the human population would be screwed if this was uh, alive and well today. <laughs> well, luckily, actually I have, I have discovered, so bubonic plague has actually not been eradicated so the black death itself still exists well i mean um, i kind of knew that from another fictional thing house there's one episode yes. on house about it yes you're right um but i mean i mean we, we can cure it now can't we yes with the proviso that we catch it early enough so it's one of those things that um the fatality rate has fallen by leaps and bounds and we're talking like 
ten percent, but please don't quote me exactly on that number. Uh, but back then, for example, we had there were all these different varieties to it. Um, and frankly, if you didn't see treatment within a few days, I mean, your prognosis wasn't fantastic. Hmm. Um, now, one of the things I guess I would kind of, like, kind of bring up to you as well is that you will meet at some point some plague doctors. And, I mean, you can't have a black plague book without plague doctors overall. Oh. Um, well, come on. It was it was a perfect opportunity to kind of play with the idea. And I think I think I sent you, when I sent you the, the, the reference material, I think you got a good look at the cover, didn't you? Yes. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna put it up in post, obviously. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but but uh, I, I will say it was kind of interesting to also research these plague doctors as well. Um, they really thought like those kinda... masks would help. <laughs> well, I mean, there was a thing at the time that was considered to be something called humorism, and there's also the idea of, um, oh my gosh, the name escapes me at the moment, but there's another school of thought that's all about evil smells causing it. Mm. So, if I had to ask you, like, why do we have the beaks actually on the plague doctors? I, See if you know this. A little I, bit of a I, I'm trying to remember how to put it exactly, but the, I don't know. It, it contains their own air, so that the air so that they're not breathing outside air. I, I don't remember. Or something it's about the close. something about the keeping it keep, the, because it has a long beak. It keeps it away from you. I, I can't remember. So the the idea was they call it is that. Um, sickness was caused by something called miasma. Now, miasma, of course, these days is when, you know, somebody has a bean burrito and lets loose at the wrong time, but miasma for them was, um, I smell this, it's an evil spirit or evil scent, I'm going to get sick. Uh, and so those, those longer beaks would be stuffed with sweet-smelling ideas. Oh. Um, like, like cloves, for example. We see cloves at this point as being like spicing a drink or something like that, or something you maybe put into oranges around the holidays. Cloves for them were considered to be almost a medicinal idea. They, they would put powdered cloves up within these beaks in part to kind of continue to keep the breath or the, the air coming into their noses and mouths a little bit sweeter, a little bit fresher, hmm. and somehow keeping them healthier. So, uh, I have another but, question. Um, I'm going to ask. No, um, this was going to be coming out September regardless of current events, right? And and do you see the irony of it coming out during the coronavirus, and we're and we're wearing masks? So so a small confession. Um, originally, I had had a, a publisher lined up through this entire process, um, and and while we had not set this year as being the publishing that you know the final publishing release date, what ended up happening is um, the pandemic hit and kind of everything went on hiatus. Um, and to me, I, I admit it. I saw myself that this is a story that told to the rest of the world. I mean, we have an opportunity here to think, okay, our experience is not singular. There are other people that have gone through the same kind of trying times that we have. And while it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, we can make it. We are resilient. As a society, as a species, we've come through far worse than what we've done going through right now. And I thought that this was a, an opportunity to really kind of drive that point home. This is a story that is all about survival. And it's all about being together, and it's all about kind of rising above the kind of petty nonsense that we kind of divides us from day to day. So, um, originally, I don't know that it was supposed to come out this year. As the pandemic hit, I admit I saw this and I was like, you know what, this is this is the time we need to read this story. That was so. really good planning. <laughs> What's up, sorry? Really good planning. I wish I could say it was a fortuitous accident, but it's, it fortune has nothing to do with it. I think it was just um, it was an opportunity that had to be taken, you know? Uh, we, we covered a good bit of ground. Of course. Um, maybe if you're okay with it, maybe I'll talk a little about next projects and things like that. I definitely always have stuff going on. Maybe we can talk about where your podcast is going for you at the same time. I was looking at your previous episodes and it definitely goes kind of it kind of spans the gamut so what's next really so maybe if you kind of give me a chance i'll ask you a couple questions about this then too i can't guarantee you know a lot but at the same time maybe we can have this give a roadmap for some of your your listeners as well does that make sense yeah um if you don't want to it's, it's completely fine i'm not gonna no no it's not that it's just i it's funny enough i was thinking 
like where where am I going to next? Because um, now I've done superheroes three times. I mean, yes, the conversation is different every single time, but it's three times, and the podcast is only well now fifteen episodes deep. <laughs> So you have a fifth of them being superheroes. So if if I had to kind of maybe push a little bit, maybe um, since you're doing movies right now, maybe go into cliche or, or, or tropes. Like you've seen TVTropes.com, I'm sure, right? No, but I watch a lot of Nostalgia Critic, and one of his videos are tropes that he hates, and then there's another one that's tropes that he loves. But you know what? Perfect. Take take that and run with it, dude. Even even if it's a five minute mini episode kind of thing, or um, you know, tropes done well, and now we have you know white hat black hat or tropes subverted or something like that. Um, maybe take it from the perspective as you're trying to go and look at movies as a, as a bigger whole, or how did how did cinema change overall? I mean, the 20s and 30s we have. You know, here's the pure American spreading democracy as he should, and then we go into kind of morally ambiguous 50s and 60s. We have James Bond show up more often. Um, 70s and 80s, there's a disillusionment. 90s, we have like nostalgia for the old times, but plus action, and we have this weird kind of transition. So, if I had to suggest, maybe I think that's that's definitely an area that you can definitely delve a lot more into if you wanted to. And that's just spitballing, so. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think I think you're right that that superheroes. I think is probably going to be a little bit unless you really want to go directly in just that direction completely. No, it's just the, the two people that were on last time. That's mostly where we talk. We, we most of the people I've had on, mm-hmm. all the people I've had on, <laughs> with the exception of you, are all co-workers in one way or another. I either used to work with them or I currently work with them. And the last two, Walt and Sam, that's mostly what we talked about when we were at work. Superheroes, <laughs> so I just knew it would be easy. No, I trust me. I get that. Um, Some of this I might keep in because um, that's totally fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. Um, I probably should have cleared the piss or got off the pot thing from before. But I don't yeah, care. Was, I don't yeah, care. I, sure. I, I will not censor my my guest or myself. Um, so long as you're not using any slurs or or like yeah. talking bad about anyone I don't care okay there's something of course I didn't really cover beforehand but yeah, I just wanted it was something I probably should have checked beforehand but just a me thing yeah I mean um, you saw me kind of skirting around the subject about like the, the different kind of um people oh yeah <laughs> in the world and and I tried to talk about to then versus now and I never know how to talk about that it's such a touchy subject I wish I could just say what's on my mind but it's going to be taken even though it's like happening as it's I don't know I just hate having to think and talk at the same time because it's, it's, you get stuff like really what okay. it just happened <laughs> where you're stuttering it's, <laughs> it's it's really okay um, I have most of the students I work with some I, I do academic stuff during the you know the daylight hours um, most of my students are Jewish um, so actually I remember recently actually I just I threw this book in front of one of my students and I was like read it and I didn't tell him it was from me, but I was like, basically, how do you feel about the way they get that Jews get portrayed here and stuff like that? And they were like, you know, there's stuff, some things I, th- I would change, but it's more, it's not, oh, you were evil about it. I think. Oh, honestly, as you're honestly, writing it, you, you had them read it? No, actually, they, they were they were with me for reading comprehension. So over the last about five, six weeks, they read through it. Oh, okay. What I will say is that if you shoot straight with your listeners and be like, you know what, um, Say that same thing. Hey, you know. Well, I'm probably going to keep that in there too. <laughs> What's that? I'm probably going to keep that in there too. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, if if you're straight, if your listeners are like, yo, you know, I'm going to tell you guys right now, and you know me. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat things, but at the same time, I'm not going to go and you know say anything bad. And if you have to make it make a trigger warning beforehand, the people who are going to listen to you, they're going to give you the time of day. Right, but it's just the way I would say things and I don't think it's like I don't think it's offensive at all but I mean when I start thinking about it I was like eh, maybe that does sound offensive and I just kind of skirt around it <laughs> so to give you an idea of something that definitely happened for me is early on in the first couple chapters when I mentioned the idea of Muslims being in the, in this, in the, the city itself um was I put M O S, which 
was a pejorative at the time, which would have oh, made perfect sense. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, when I was reading it, it was like, this is like this is coming out perfect timing, like the coronavirus, Black Plague. It's, I mean, it's a good topic. It should sell well. But it's like, I don't know, talking about it like this. But, you, I mean, you got to be in the mindset that like, this is the time. <laughs> oh, this yeah. is a time frame. This isn't today. I, I will tell you, attitudes will shift here and there. Well, you already see that um, with, with Abraham and uh, w Wilderich. I mean, you, grant you, I only got to the beginning of those attitudes being shifted. But um, I, the fact that Dietrich doesn't seem to care. He just he wants to work with people. He doesn't care beyond that. He wants to work with people. And that's really, really good. That's, that's what's, it's, what's really going to work in this. Because he's kind of an anomaly. I, I'm not familiar with... Of course, I'm not a history buff, but I'm not familiar with people from history at that time period that just, like, people, just people, they're people. Caring, yeah. Actually, surprisingly enough, the, the other person with whom I mentioned uh, had a very similar thought process. Well, I was like, no, 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 people didn't do that. I hate to tell you, actually, it's just that we don't talk about it very often because it doesn't fit the perspective that we tend to have the time period. Yeah, um, like, like go watch example. a Tarantino movie and pe tell me people didn't do that. <laughs> Oh yeah, use use the word "n" every other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching Django or um, uh, Hateful Eight, yeah, that, that's uncomfortable to watch or yeah. well, listen to. But I mean, and, that's and, and, it's Tarantino it's, for one, and yes. it's a time period. But you got to yes. remember, it's Tarantino. He 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 doesn't care. He's got to make the movement no matter what. You you have to be able to separate the artist from the art. And while I'm not going to pretend to call myself an artist just yet, I mean, I think right now there's a couple pre pre-orders here and there, but you got to be able to separate that. Well, in people here, in the probably. comments, no, not the comments, in the description below, go and pre-order right now. <laughs> oh, by all means. Yes. By all means. Go down, click on that Amazon link, pre-order it. It's I'm worth it. it I only read five chapters, but I know it's worth it. Um, I might press you for a final review before we kind of wrap up for it, but... Uh... That's, I mean, and hey, we can come back. I, I mean, I we'll come know. back to this. Like after I read the book, we can we can go over, and Happily. I can get I can get your thoughts on like certain areas or whatever. Happily, uh, I will be more than happy to do that. I know that just for me, I think that if if you, for this podcast, for whatever project you want to take, there's going to be an audience for it. Um, I like to think that about my writing. I think at one point I started writing this book. I remember thinking to myself, no one's going to buy this. This might be like a friends and family book and that'd be about it. But I think that it was a little bit small-minded small, small minded of me to think that. I think that once you peel back, the, peel back even just the beginning of it, it's, it's universal. It's an opportunity that a million people could read this book and each get something different out of it. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I'd be happy with 5,000. I'd be happy with 10,000. I mean, oh, God, that'd be blow my mind if I get 10,000 people. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you is where your podcast is right now in terms of the superheroes, who cares? Not a big deal. No, I understand that. Um, actually, this conversation, it's kind of been all over the place. I mean, granted, there's a solid first part where we're talking about you and your book great but I also love how it's going all over the place and I've really been inspired I did this because of Joe Rogan okay I mean I'm sure and he's he said he's he said other people been inspired by him to start a podcast and and that's why I'm like I don't care what you say just just say it and plus YouTube's not I, I'm not monetized by YouTube so they're not gonna demonetize me for swear words or anything like that. Now, once that happens, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what my avenues are. Well, okay, I know what my avenues are, but I, I don't know until it happens, really. So, That's I'm not I'm not worried about it. So long as you're not being hateful towards anyone, I don't care. Well, the funny thing is that you were mentioning before about different concepts and different attitudes about Dietrich and Sophie and me and my sister. Um, with who I am as an individual, I don't care. You could have been black, white, trans, straight, gay. I don't care. Yeah. I would judge you on the merits of your personality. Oh, and yeah. That's the important thing. To I am. Mean, so I, if I haven't gotten into a conversation like this, well, okay, not for a while, but I always go back to Martin Luther King. Judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, or yeah. their or their orientation, or whatever. Just they're people. 
People are yeah. people are people. <laughs> and, and, and I will say one of the conflicts that we kind of see here with this book overall is one of the things I try to kind of go in with that too. Yeah, you, that. you really do accomplish that by having the first person perspective and Dietrich just... I want to work with people. I don't who, care... Who gives a shit? I just yeah. want to get this done. Yeah, <laughs> I, want, I want to get to the, the bottom of this. I, there's, I want to save who I can because this is, this is going to affect all of us. And that's, and that's, I think at the end of this, if all I've done is inspired one person to look at somebody else in a different way, that would be a success. Um, forget the background of the Black Death, forget all the things that happen in this book, and like, like I said to you before, you haven't even gotten to what I really like one of the big characters in the book itself. Hmm. Um... It was also a lot of fun to write. I think represents a very unique piece of myself. Um, it's a story about just people and just the way that they put aside their survive. differences and yeah. come together. Yeah. Which is another thing we really, really need right now. I mean, have you seen the country? It's on fire. Yes. Yes. We Literally really need something to bring us together. And yes. Uh, go read his book. I haven't. Again, description below. Go pre-order it. It's worth it. We need something to bring us together. And if this one book can help in any way, go pre-order it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I really appreciate that, Steve. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I will say, I will say, if you don't mind, if readers, by the way, any any prospective people, if the Black Death isn't your thing, if 17th century Vienna isn't your thing, um, I have a two-part book actually coming out, or two-book series coming out, one of the Night of Sorrows and Day of Mourning, talking about the Aztecs and the Spaniards meeting as well. So historical fiction there. But uh, that, that similarly has been a lot of fun to kind of take a look at. Much more classical, you know, meeting of worlds itself. But it was also Actually, that just reminded about. me. Before I read it, I thought that's what you were working on. I thought that was going to be published. Because I remember on Discord, we talked about it. And I we thought did. that's what this book was going to be. Um, so I, I think I mean this book I finished writing this book about 18 months ago the first draft was done about 18 months ago um, and it's been you know editing and, and lining up the, you know, the, the artist to commission the cover and the back and, and honestly I have to say um, the artist that I worked with I've actually found on Fiverr amazing young woman her artwork is absolutely impeccable if you actually want to find more of her work she, I do give her a byline in the front of the book but uh, her stuff's incredible um, but no so that that book that you're talking about right now Night of Sorrows actually I'm on Day of Mourning Night of Sorrows is, is completing its edit and kind of slowly going towards publishing itself um, that probably at least the first of those books will probably come out in time to celebrate or commemorate more accurately the Spanish and the Aztecs uh, meeting 500 years ago. Hmm. So, uh, this book has just had its 350th anniversary of the events that it covers, and the Aztecs will have its 500th anniversary, I think, in October of next year. Oh, so, nice. I've been, I'm trying to push hard to kind of get both those those dates kind of understood and, and, and recognized. Oh, very nice. So. Uh, but, you know, Steve, I know we've talked a little bit about where I'm going with myself. Like, I know anxious listeners are trying to know what's next for you. <laughs> well, okay. So today I was thinking, like, what other topics I could have. Uh, I talked Star Wars. That was the very first one. I could, I can always go back to Star Wars because there's so much to talk about. Um, but I also was thinking Star Trek. Um, I was thinking of get, about getting my buddy Austin to talk Star Trek again, even though off camera we've had lots of arguments about Star Trek because I'm not the biggest fan of the newest stuff coming out um, I haven't finished Enterprise but it's kinda like eh. aside from the crew being the first ones to explore deep deep space we've seen this before um, Discovery those those seasons are garbage I mean the second one's a little better but I mean I don't know Oh, I mean, if I ever get on, if I ever record a podcast about it, I'll really get into it. But um, I'm, I'm more, yeah. So talk about Star Trek. Where did our love for Star Trek come from? I mean, that's most of the conversations start out like, where did our love for 
X come from. Um, and I kind of have an interesting story about that. Um, are you a Star Trek guy? I have dabbled. I have dabbled. I have my own perspectives on each of the particular ver versions of it, but go for it. Oh. No, I was just wondering, because, I mean, bring you on on that one. Um, uh, I, I, I grew up with Star Wars, I will admit. Um, Legend Star Wars, I can tell you all the seven forms of lightsaber combat, and I can tell you all you, the You and Austin get, get, get along swimmingly, because he, he's, he's... I'm more like the visual Star Wars end... If it's been on screen, I, I can tell you about it. But the, the reading aspect, very little. Um, there was, um, I can't remember the name of the book series. I read a few of the books. But it was basically um, Goosebumps or R.L. Stein's, well, no, that's the same person, for uh, Star Wars. I'm trying to remember the name of the series. But it was basically Goosebumps for Star Wars. It was about these two siblings. And <laughs> oh, Jason, Jason and Jaina, they have the young Jedi stuff. I think... Jason, the, the Solo twins? And then no, 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 no. No, okay. No, no. It's, it's kind of ties into Rise of Skywalker. They're actually the grandchildren of Palpatine. Oh, good old Sheev. Uh, I wish I could remember the... I can't Galaxy remember the name of, of this, this book series. But it's Galaxy his book... Of Fear. Yes, that's it. Yes, they're actually the grandchildren of of Palpatine, and I, I can't remember if it's both of them or if it's the 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 sister or the brother. They have a conversation with Luke, and Luke's like, "Well, my father was Darth Vader," so it's like, "You're not Palpatine," stuff like that. And that's like the first time I've ever been introduced to that kind of thinking. But um, other Star Wars books, I tried reading. Um, I can't remember the trilogy. It was probably the. Not the Thrawn trilogy. That was but, a good one, actually. Yeah, I've heard really good things about it. But I just... Heir to the Empire. Well, okay, so reading... I'm a casual reader because... One, my parents read to me Aesop Fables when I was a kid. Just put me to sleep. And I keep on telling them, like, you just read it to put me to sleep, right? And they were like, yeah. I mean, like, in a positive way, like, to give you morals and stuff. Put you to sleep. Like, no, you made me bored, so I went to sleep. And they just... I don't know why they can't click with that. And that kind of put me off. And on top of that, I'm dyslexic. It's gotten better because I'm reading more. So I'm not rereading the same sentence or paragraph over and over again. But I, just being dyslexic does not help. I can imagine. I do know for me sometimes I will actually look at books and my eyes are just flitting all over the page. I don't think I've ever really been um, diagnosed with anything, at least to my knowledge. But... I know that there's sometimes that when I was younger, it was hard for me to focus on the words on the page. I would just be just, I was just too busy looking at everything else. Mm. I will say that for me, my parents were like, here's books, here's books, here's books, to the point that uh, the family house had probably had enough works in it to house a small library. I was very, <laughs> very fortunate on that one. So, yeah, so um, reading, like, my dad and I, my dad reads more than me, but he mostly reads. I come from a Catholic family, so he, he reads the Bible. There's actually like a, a subscription that he gets, and he reads the Bible along with his booklet. Um, but my mom and my brother are the big readers, and they read fast too. Uh, I wish I could read as fast as they can, but I've, I mean, I've gotten better by reading more, and I listen to instrumental music. So I'll listen to like the Skyrim soundtrack, or um, the Sky, the, the soundtrack to. Final Fantasy VII Remake just came out. And I, 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 I don't know why, but I seem to focus better when I'm listening to music. No, trust me, I understand that, because at that point, it's, a, it's an auditory thing. We block out the distractions, and since it's instrumental, we're not focusing on the words. I, I was listening to um, Two Steps from Hell quite a bit when I wrote portions of this. I was listening to Thomas Bergeson, um Oh my gosh, I can't think of the other guys. Uh... Baba Yetu. Oh my gosh, who does that? Christopher Teen, of the, uh, who does like a lot of the Civilization stuff for Civilization 5 and 6. Um, trust me, when I write, music has to be on. It's got to be on. So I understand that. I, I really understand that greatly. Uh, no, I, I understand with music with writing. I mean, I've talked about my writing a little bit, but I haven't really done that much this year. I've been focusing, getting into a schedule for Jamps and Entertainment. Um, I just had a conversation with my brother the other day. It's like, what was the difference between like last year and this year? It's like, this year, 
I'm actually taking this seriously. I thought I was taking it seriously, but actually looking back is like I wasn't taking it seriously. And I the worst part is I don't know if you you experienced this or had experiences before you finished the book, but I have all these ideas for the story I want to tell, and I either just don't write them down, or I just or, or I'll have them when I'm nowhere near my notebook to write them down, and they just kind of float away. <laughs> Use your cell phone. I mean, for me, like, if I have I have a journal next door, actually. I have two journals. I have one for uh, just me thoughts, and I have another one that's, that's purely for my writing. So, um, after the Aztec book, part of me wants to go to the Thirty Years' War, part of me wants to go to, um, wants to go to the Forge War, it's a thing over here in, the, in New Jersey that happened back in the American Revolution, which was really insane. Hmm. Um, another part of me wants to go to Serbia for like the rise and fall of parts of Serbia. I have a Serbian friend who's huge on the history and more than happy to help me with it. Well, um, but even if you're not near something, you always you have your cell phone on you at all times, basically, right? Yeah, but I don't use it. I don't use it like that. I, use, I mean, I use it. I use it for apps like Facebook, Instagram. Um, I have like my bank my bank uh, app on there and stuff like that. I record sometimes on there, well, well, voice record for videos. I do use a memo, especially when I'm trying to do a post. I use the memo. I just copy and paste that instead of typing it out every single time when I make a post. Mm -hmm. um, but that's but no, you're you're on the right path already. I mean, the the, lar the hardest thing to do is to be used to the idea of it's it's the organization behind it. Let's put it that way. You should see my, my internet bookmarks are like, here's this the Aztec uh, reading material, bam, 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 Spanish reading material, bam, 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 bam. So I'll have, you know, 30 or 40 different sites as reference material. I'll have PDFs, uh, PDFs on another side. Um, you should see just the stuff of first, you know, harm. I have an entire folder on my computer that's got about 50 different files in it. It's Well, I, I definitely know where you're coming from with that because um, I'm... <laughs> The other problem is I'm working on it like a huge story. It start. It's gonna. I mean, I, I wrote it. Um, I think it's starting in like 2020 or 2024. Now I have to make it fictional because it was gonna be. Well, the characters were gonna be fictional, but I was gonna have it mirror what's happening. But coronavirus happened, and I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to go back because that's a lot of rewriting. So now it's just a complete fiction, but it's our world. Um, but it starts out near future and it ends up in space at least a hundred years down the road and I've written uh, I've come up with two alien races and I've written some about them and some short stories about them and I kind of base them off America and Russia because there's a space race the, and that's about the only thing I take from that the, so I have it it's set in a real at a real star location, okay. But I'm taking liberties with it because I can. Of course. <laughs> so yeah, one that's, plan. That's part of the thing. So I kind of make it like Earth and Mars as it's like where the distance is because and there's an asteroid belt there, and so the space race actually becomes what, well, like Mir, the okay. internet, the first international space station where they joined. Well, it's it's that mixed with like what if the Cold War went hot, and so if they're they're not actually going there for peace, they're going there for war, and each side is trying to deceive each other. I can see it. Yeah. I can see it. That actually that would work really quite well. Um, well, I, like I have that. that going on, like just like. See, I don't know, because the idea went from being a book series to a comic book series to an anime series. That's the other problem. My ideas just run away with themselves. Um, but I want to tell that story, but also have the humans come in because so the humans they, they they're Mass Effect is the only other one that I've seen do this, but the humans are still technologically behind the other aliens. This will the humans will be technologically advanced because these two factions have been going after each other. They haven't thought about exploration. They thought about kill the other guy. Um, so the humans just send a probe out there because why would you send out people? The probe gets taken out because at this point the two factions actually have come together and become their own like government. 
and so then you have the humans go, go out on a ship. Um, I don't know if my, be... my advice would be yeah. If you're gonna write this in the first place, or you you want to kind of the way you want to go throughout all this, first book, two alien species, bam, there we go. Maybe at the end, now we have that last little thing. The, the probe comes in, bam, and you know it says whatever the acronym is for the for the human society overall. Yeah, I, I, that's that's how I planned on doing it. But I really really like the idea of, and I think more visually than I do, like in, in a book sense. You've read some of my writing. It's mm -hmm. it's pretty atrocious. No. Yes. No. You just it, you okay? Hey, you got it. You just got to get used to the idea that there's going to be rewrites. Right, but uh, it's gonna it's, I don't know, it's, I, reading, reading what you've you, reading the first five chapters, like I have a long, long way to go to to even come close to being this exciting to read. Jim, I, I think at some place on my computer, I have one of the first things I ever wrote, and it's pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's okay. It's not gonna be perfect the first time through it. I've been doing this now since 2012, 2013. I've been writing since then. Actually, yeah. how about 2014? So, this is, this is six years in, dude. Yeah, that's another thing I just need to write, but uh, as I stated before, like, I, I've focused and I've finally gotten into a schedule. I just need to schedule in writing. You'll get there. Yeah. I haven't um, written since the pandemic hit, because I've been so busy trying to push this out, and... Yeah. Work got heavy. It happens. It's okay. You'll get there. If you need me to help you out in terms of trying to keep you on course, like, yo, dude, hey, this is the time to do scheduling or just check-ins, tell me how I can help you, and I'll do it. Okay? Yeah. Dude, you're, and you're, you're, you, might, you might be Delco, and I might be NJ, but uh, we'll make it work somehow, okay? Yeah. I really do appreciate the fact that you brought me on here. Oh, yeah, no problem. I appreciate you coming on, because you, you're the first person I don't actually know <laughs> You're like the first real guest. You're not just a... I mean, where we're we're coming from is, but you're just not a friend that I just kind of like, you know, come on my podcast. No, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Well, this, you're, the, you're the second interview I've ever done. So, you know, hopefully it wasn't you know, too much of an embarrassment overall. So hopefully, you know, people... Well, I, I hope I'm not in, an embarrassment. My mom used to write for the Inquirer. She so was what? a reporter. So <laughs> what? <laughs> so what? She, she did exactly what she needed to do at the time. She enjoyed herself. And she would do it again, right? So, well, no, no, I'm just saying, like, uh, I, I mean, my mom was a reporter. I was hope I, I did a halfway decent interview. That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you did well. I, you, let, you let me talk a little bit more often than I probably should have, so that was on me, actually. But then, no, you asked questions. You actually went organic with it. You flattered me, which is always nice to, you know, to, to the guest. You, you say about how wonderful they are. Dude, this is like Jimmy Fallon. This is perfect. So. Well, well, I mean, it's, it's genuine, like, praise. I mean, it's you, really good. I really like this first five chapters, and I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm really, I'm really flattered. <laughs> Sincerely, again, like I think I said to you already, it's I'm, I'm so used to putting my toe in the dirt because it's just that's the kind of person I try to be. But uh, um, forgive me, by the way, I'm gonna have to go in a couple minutes. I've actually yet to eat dinner. My girlfriend got back a couple minutes ago. But, oh. um It really was a pleasure to be on here. All right. Oh, uh, do you want people to find you? If you, if you do, where can they find you? Ah, okay. So if if you desperately want to find me, people, uh, you can find me actually on both Facebook and Twitter. I, I admit social media is not my forte. I, I craft fiction, not tweets. Uh, but you can find me at the real K Avard, K A V A R D. Uh, so that's both on Facebook and on Twitter. More than happy to interact with you guys, talk to you guys, answer any questions. And heck, if you want me to read something you got, let me know. I'm happy to do it. I, I always want to encourage a new generation of writers out there. So. All right, cool. Yeah, uh, send that to me in just a Discord message, and I'll I'll Absolutely. put a visual in post. Absolutely. Um, thank you for coming on. It's it's a really, pleasure really talking really to pleasure. you. Really liked thank it. You, thank you for having me. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really looking. Look, what? No, I was say, I'm, actually, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens actually after your you know the book comes out you know on your birthday. It's my gift to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when the book comes out, I'm be really interested to see, see what you have to say about the you know the rest of the story there too. So go on. There's a description below to get to pre-order your copy. It's worth it. I'm definitely really worth it. Great mystery. I'm hooked. First five chapters. I I want to read more. 
Thank you very much. But all right. Um. Yeah. I'm recording this Monday, so tomorrow I'm back on Twitch. Um, okay. Join the conversation there, playing Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, check out this podcast on all your podcast platforms. Uh, Jamson Entertainment, look forward to the, the review of Tenet coming out Thursday. Um, and the following Thursday is going to be... I'm going to see New Mutants. I'm going to go back to theaters. I'm, I'm so happy we're back in theaters. So look forward to that review on YouTube Thursdays. Um, I just watched Crimson Tide again. I'm going to review that. So I'm going to do... Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh... I found out something pretty funny in the beginning about the story, <laughs> but look forward to that. I'm going to do a double review. There's going to be a throwback re review next Thursday with the review of New Mutant, so tune in for that. If you like what you saw, like it. If you think other people like it, share it. If you really liked it, hit the subscribe button. Thank you for watching and listening, and live your imagination.